Shalom, this is Reverend John Ferret, and welcome to Lesson 39 in the Gospel According to Moses in the book of Genesis. Now before we begin, I'd like to recall the four major goals of this series, and also the series with Exodus. Those four purposes. The first purpose is Jesus in John 5.39, in Luke 24.27, and in Luke 24.44, really points out that the scripture in Jesus' day, by his own words, is the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures. John 5.39, Jesus says, All scripture testifies of me. He says it in those days when there was no New Testament. He's in the upper room in Luke 24. He's meeting with the disciples after his resurrection. And it says he goes through the books of Moses and the prophets and the writings, the Old Testament. That's, that's how it was termed in those days, the three sections of the Old Testament. And he's saying it testifies of him. So where is Jesus in the Old Testament? Where is Jesus in the Hebrew Scriptures? And at that time, the primary books of the Old Testament in Jesus' day was the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. So this is one of our purposes. Where is Jesus? How does the Torah testify of him? Second of all, Jesus says in John 8, 31 through 32, and then again in John 17, 17, when he's praying to his father, he's talking about the word. And through the word, we will know the truth, and the truth will set us free. And that we're sanctified in truth. We're made holy. We're separated into God's people. So, if that's our understanding, we need to study the Torah for its own sake. We need to study the Torah and to see how God inspired Moses to tell us the gospel. The gospel according to Moses. The good news for all mankind. So we will study his Torah for its own sake. Third, what about those Hebrews who just came out of Egypt? Perhaps the second generation on the plains of Moab. Moses is now buried. And all of a sudden they're going to be reading the parchments that he has. And they're the first ones to hear it. Now all they knew were the gods of Egypt. All they knew was the mythology of Egypt. So how did they hear these words in the Torah for the first time? It's as if the Bible was written to them. The Torah was written to them. And indeed, one great Bible theologian, historian, scholar, archaeologist, Egyptologist, Dr. John Kareed, he has shown that in the Torah is a concept called polemic theology. And it's as if God is using things in his Torah to come against things that the Hebrews experienced in Egypt so that his people could leave Egypt behind, not just physically, but spiritually as well. So how did they understand the Torah? What was God's initial meaning? The only way that we can understand the initial meaning is trying to figure out how they may have heard it. Fourth, for at least 600, maybe 70, 80, 90 years after Jesus' ascension, the early church exploded. And they changed the world. And they brought the gospel of the kingdom to the pagan world of the Roman Empire. But all they had was the Old Testament. All they had was the Hebrew Scriptures. So how did they proclaim the gospel of the kingdom when that's all they had? We today need not only to capture how they did it, to see Jesus in the Hebrew Scriptures, but also to try to recapture the initial powerful meaning that God had for the Hebrews then and for us today. I have a document with the four purposes of this podcast series in Genesis and also 
the podcast series in Exodus. We're going to do all five books, God willing. I provided a link for this document at the website, www.lightofmenorah.org. And menorah is spelled M-E-N-O-R-A-H. All one word. And if you find this session, session 39, and underneath the picture, there's a description before the podcast. The podcast itself, where you're going to listen to, is way at the end of that introductory comments that I make. But in the introductory comments, you'll find the link to the document that talks about the four purposes of this podcast series. Now, in Lesson 38, it seems as if God has come to the limit of his patience. <laughs> Sodom and Gomorrah are going to be totally annihilated. But this is interesting because we remember the flood. All humankind in that time was annihilated. It's almost as if there's... God is saying to us, there's a limit to his patience. Remember Pharaoh? In Hebrew, now I'm going to say this again, in Hebrew, again and again, God tried to give courage to Pharaoh's heart. In Hebrew, that Hebrew word to give courage to the heart has been translated to harden, a negative meaning. And again and again in Hebrew, Pharaoh strengthens his own resolve, his own heart, if you would. Strengthen his commitment not to let the people go. And then finally, a line is crossed. A line that is the limit of God's patience. And he forces the situation. And us too. There's an ending. There's a limit. There's a boundary in time before his return. We've all been warned, but few heed this warning. Do you realize that they did a study of millennials, which is young people ages about mm, 23 to about 45 here in the year 2021? And in that study, they found that most millennials who were Christians in their high school years have now departed the church. And what they say in their own words is that Jesus cannot be found in the church based upon the people live, the way they live. And it's interesting because how do Christians learn about how we're supposed to live unless they're involved and indoctrinated and deeply involved in learning God's Word. There's a limit. Are we written in the Book of Life? It seems like God definitely has his limits, his and, and a limit to his patience with us. Imagine 62 million babies murdered because of abortion since Rose versus Wade. We have a warning. He's coming. And says, in Sodom, and as in Sodom and Gomorrah, let us hope we've not crossed that line. So, what did the people in Sodom and Gomorrah do to deserve that disaster? What line did they cross? The Torah is silent. The Torah does not give us any thing specific to say they did this, so therefore God is going to annihilate. Sodom and Gomorrah. A dear sister in the Lord mentioned to me that a friend of hers came to her and said, hey, in Ezekiel 16, verses 49 through 50, is the reasons why God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So let's read it. Ezekiel 16, verses 49 through 50 from the New American Standard. Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom, and probably implying Gomorrah as well. She and her daughters had arrogance, abundant food, and careless ease, but she did not help the poor and needy. 
Thus they were haughty and committed abominations before me. Therefore I removed them when I saw it. This reminded me of Proverbs 6, 16. Here we had just read that those who lived in Sodom and Gomorrah probably had arrogance, pride, prosperity, riches. They did not help the poor and needy and they committed abominations before God. Now, just to let you know, when you study the word abominations, uh, in your English Bible, uh, you're going to be reading, and all of a sudden you're going to come across the fact that uh, eating pork is an abomination, or um, eating unclean fish is an abomination. Now, there's a Hebrew word that the translators translated into abomination, and it really is an abomination. It really is that something that is forbidden something that you should not do to prove yourself that you're part of my people. Uh, when you eat pork, uh, or, or if you're sacrificing your child to a, a god, one, one's something restricted in Judaism, but the other one is an abomination. That's where, if you go to Deuteronomy 12, verse 31, that Hebrew word there that's translated by the translators into abomination is something so hideously evil. Yes, it is an abomination. So we have two separate Hebrew words translated into abomination. This drives me crazy why the translators did this. The people in Sodom and Gomorrah were committing abominations. And like I said, this reminded me of what God said in Proverbs 6, 16. So again, reading in the New American Standard, it says, These are there are six things which the Lord hates, seven which are an abomination to him, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil, a false witness who utters lies, and one who spreads strife among brothers. You know, it's almost as if the things that God hates that we see in Proverbs, which was written by Solomon, probably, let's say, 900 B.C., is very similar to what Ezekiel's writing in about 500 B.C., almost 400 years later. Arrogance, pride hurting the innocent, not helping the helpless or the needy. So perhaps we do see what may have caused God to say, no more, enough. So we come now to Lesson 39, and one of the things that we're going to ask us is, what's wrong with Lot? <laughs> He's sitting in the gate, so we're going to find that that's a big deal. It means he's been accepted in the higher echelons of that community, that utterly evil community that's going to be destroyed by God. Why is he sitting there? Take a look at the wink links on the website that I have for you. Links on an article on sitting in the gates. What does that mean from a biblical perspective? And also, Lois Tverberg, a wonderful wonderful scholar and who writes just amazing stuff about the Jewish background of her faith. She's got, what, a number, th about three books right now, maybe four, sitting at the feet of Rabbi Jesus, walking in the dust of R Rabbi Jesus, uh, reading the Bible with Rabbi Jesus and others. She is amazing, and she's got an article, a short article about Lot's choice. He's sitting in the gates. Why won't he leave? God had to send his messengers, we call them angels, to force him to get out. Now, this isn't the only time we see this. We remember in Egypt. We remember in Egypt that Jacob and his entire family moved down there because of the uh, worldwide plague. He dies, and his son Joseph, second in command of Egypt, takes Jacob's body after he's been mummified, and buries him at the cave of Machpelah in southern Israel. Now, they were all returned to Egypt, and they don't leave. They don't leave. 
God had a force amount. Matter of fact, in the book of Ezekiel, you can actually find that God said, I had to force them out of Egypt because they assimilated into the culture. Dennis Prager, many of you know, is a great conservative radio host, but he is also, what few people know, a great Torah teacher and an expert in Hebrew. He talks about all of this. <laughs> so why didn't the Germans, why, why didn't the Jews leave Germany after World War I? The writing was on the wall, especially with Hitler's rise to power. What's wrong with Lot? What's wrong with the Hebrews? And on top of that, though, the message is, what's wrong with us? Once again, you guys, the ancient words written 3,400 years ago apply to us today. So come, let's delve into his word just as Jesus commanded us in John 8, 31 through 32. If we actually take a look at the Greek and actually go to the Hebrew, the Hebrew actually has a meaning of relying on his word, immersing ourselves in his word, integrating our worldview into his word so it becomes our worldview that we endure and persevere life upon his word. And we will know the truth. And the truth will set us free. So come, let's study and grasp the truth that sets us free. So in chapter 19, and I'm reading from the, again, the Jerusalem Bible from Koren Publishers in Jerusalem. And starting in 19, I'm going to read uh, 19 verses 1 through 29. And there came two angels to Sidom at evening, and Lot sat in the gate of Sidom. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face to the ground. And he said, Behold, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet. And you may rise up early and go your ways. And they said, No, but we will abide in the street all night. And he pressed upon them greatly. And they turned into him and entered into his house. And he made them a feast and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, compa uh, compassed the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called to Lot and said to him, where are the men who came in to thee this night? Bring them out to us, that we may know them. Now remember last class, we dealt with what was the sin of Sidom and Amora, Sodom and Gomorrah. We came to no conclusion that there was any one thing going on. There was a lot going on because their evil was grievous in the sight of God. And there was cries coming from the city. God heard the cry of those in Sodom and Gomorrah because of the evil in that place, okay? So it's not just about homosexuality. Are you kidding? It can't be. Probably has a lot to do with the powerful, the influential, coming upon the weak and taking advantage of the weak, persecuting the weak, and using the weak for their own purposes. So therefore, for instance, if you have people in the LGBT community, they would certainly say, we disagree with you Christians, that you, you just have this whole thing, this is all homosexuality. No, it's not. Okay? There's homosexuality going on here, don't get me wrong. Okay? But let's put it this way. If some of these people, and many of them were men, wanted to have sex with men, you would definitely say they're part of the LGBT community. Okay? But there were probably men there that were not part of the LGBT community, and there was just horrendous, savage abuse going on, whether they're part of that community or not. So you could have godly people who forsaken God doing this, and you could have other people who were totally 
uh, living a homosexual lifestyle that were part of this as well. So across the board, you can have the powerful and the strong coming against the weak. So, again, where are the men who came into the, uh, this night? Uh, that bring them out to us that we may know them. And Lot went at the door to them. And when it says we, me, we may know them, okay, so please understand that's yada. And to know them is to know them sexually. That's one aspect of yada. There are others. Again, it's a conceptual meaning. So therefore, in chapter 4 of Genesis, Adam knew his wife and they had a son. They had sex. They made love. And so they had a son. And here, the same thing is going on. We don't want to know them. We don't want to sit down and develop a relationship with them and play cribbage. This is a little stronger than that. And Lot went out of the door and shut the door after him and said, I pray you, brethren, do not, uh, do not so, wicked, uh, so wickedly. Behold, now I have two daughters who have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you and do to them as is as good in your eyes. Only to these men do nothing, seeing that they have come under the shadow of my roof. And they said, Stand back. And they said again, This one fellow came into sojourn, and he uh, needs to be a judge. Now, will we deal worse with thee than with them? And they strongly urged the man Lot, and came near to break the door. But the men put out their hand, the angels, and pulled Lot into the house to them, and shut the door. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house, with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves, they wearied themselves to find the place. And the men said to Lot, "Hast thou not here any besides? Uh, any besides?" I'm going to stop there at verse eleven, and we'll come back to this in a little bit later. Now, one of the things that when you read these verses, you have to ask yourself. What's wrong with Lot? There's something wrong with this guy. Now, first of all, we read in 19.1 that he was sitting in the gate. Right there in 19.1. Now, if you actually have a copy of the Archaeological Study Bible, so I'm trying to give you that reference. In the Archaeological Study Bible, if you actually go to the book of Ruth in chapter 4, they have a wonderful article about the gates of the city and people sitting in the gates. If you recall Boaz, and this will be in Ruth 4.1, Boaz goes to the city gate because the ten elders of the city were there and he wanted to discuss with them uh, the fact that he was second behind another one who was the redeemer of Ruth. He wanted to be the main redeemer. So he had to go to the elders. You'll remember in Genesis 23, 3, Abraham goes to the gates of the city, the gates of Hebron. You know it as Hebron. And there he says uh, to the people that are at the gate, not only the judges of the city, the administrative council, but the guy that owned the cave was there as well. He said, I want to buy that cave. And he happened to be there. The business transaction was transacted in the gate. Now here is Lot and he's sitting in the gate. Just think about what happens in the gate later on. In Nehemiah 8.1, Ezra and Nehemiah read the Torah in the courtyard of the gate. So they have a courtyard in the Jerusalem that they rebuilt with the gate and the city. And there was a courtyard for the people. <laughs> they can't be all in the gate. But they're in the gate area, and this is where they read the Torah. So the gate is just huge. Now, this suggests that if Lot is in the gate that he has assimilated into the evil culture of that city. They're accepting him as part of perhaps the ruling council, but I doubt it. That comes up a little bit later. I'll point that out in just a second here. But he is part of perhaps an advisory council. Remember, he comes in there. He's rich, right? Remember why Abraham and Lot split. They had Lots of flocks. They were both very, very wealthy men. Lot comes down, he goes into that area, and it says he camps out and he has his flocks near Sidon. And finally, they must have invited him into the city, and now because of his influence, because of his, obviously, wealth, uh, because of the fact that he's a very influential man, they must have said, why don't you sit here in the gate? Now, later on in Genesis 
um, 19, it says this. Yeah, here it is. This is in verse 9. And the people, the men that were outside, and they said again, this one fellow, meaning Lot, this one fellow, he came in here to live, to sojourn. Okay? And he will be a judge? That's a question. How can you be a judge if you're an alien? How can you be a judge if you just came here to sojourn? You see what I'm saying? He's not a native. And so that's the implication in that verse. So he buys into the wrong story. I love using that because there's a uh, DVD series out with Ray Vanderland. And Ray Vanderland has two DVDs. Uh, one, God Heard Their Cry and Fire on the Mountain. And Ray constantly, through all the videos of those DVDs, talk about the fact that the Hebrews bought into the wrong story. Okay? The story either of the Egyptian worldview and their gods or the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They bought into the wrong story. And indeed, what we have in here, um, that it seems as of Lot bought into the wrong story. The Hebrews did. We're going to talk about this once we get to Exodus. I'm going to prove to you that the Bible really, really strongly suggests that the Hebrews, from the time of Joseph all the way through the, the days when bondage began for them, they had it really good, and they began to assimilate into the culture. They bought into the gods. And you can look at it at Judges 24, 14. Joshua was saying, don't you understand, put away the gods that your fathers worshipped in Egypt. In other words, they brought statues of the gods with them. Okay? Put away those gods that your fathers worshipped in Egypt. That's only one verse of a few others. And another thing, too, is in Exodus 2.23. In Exodus 2.23, we remember now they're in bondage. All of a sudden, all of the rulers of Egypt, all the powers that be, come down on them big time. And the word there that, they, that is used in uh, Exodus 2.23, we hear this word, ze'ekah. Ze'ekah is a cry of extreme fear, of extreme pain, of extreme terror. It's not just a cry. When we read that in English, it's just, it, it's deeper than that. But they cried to no one. If you read it, they cried to no one. But God heard it. They didn't cry to God. It, the Torah does not say they cried to God. But they cried out, seemingly to no one, but God heard the cry. Now later on, in Exodus 13, they do a ze'akah again, a cry of extreme terror, because all of Pharaoh's army is right behind them. The only thing that's blocking them is the cloud of fire or the cloud during the day. That's all that's blocking them. And they do ze'akah, but it says this, okay, ze'akah le Adonai. They cried out in this terror to the Lord. Now things change after 13 chapters, okay? Because they bought into the wrong story. They didn't know who to cry out to. So seemingly, we have this concept that Lot buys into the wrong, buy, uh, the wrong story. He buys into their culture. And we'd have to ask ourselves the question. Look at this. He comes from Haran. He knows his, his uncle, that his uncle is a righteous man. He had experience with him for a number of years. And we'd have to ask ourselves, Lot, you know this stuff. Why didn't you leave? Why didn't you leave? Well, you better ask the same question, and I better ask the same question. Joseph, he buries his dad at the cave of Machpelah. Why didn't he leave? Why didn't he leave? The Jews in Germany, why didn't he leave? It's the same question. It's the same question, because the Jews in Germany assimilated into the culture. There were German men who served in World War I. They served Germany under the Kaiser. They changed their last names from the Jewish-sounding name to a German name. And they said, but I serve the Kaiser. I serve the fatherland. I serve Germany. You're Jewish. Go. And they were dead. They assimilated into that culture to forget their Jewishness. Here's another one. Why do women stay with abusive husbands? <laughs> Why do women stay with abusive husbands? This is the same question. And so when we ask the question, why didn't Lot leave? It, it, Seemingly are not answered. In Exodus 24, 12, I actually have to read it. I'll read it from the NASB. In Exodus 24, 12, 
such a key verse because God tells us exactly what the Torah is. The Torah is law. Really? Let's see what God has to say. Exodus 24, 12. Now the Lord said to Moses, Come to me up on the mountain and remain there, and I will give you the stone tablets with the law. That's what your Bible probably says. Okay? I will give you the commandments with the Torah. It doesn't say that. It says, I will give you the commandment with the Torah and the commandment which I've written for their instruction. What's the Torah for? Law? No. Instruction. God said it. Argue with him. You don't, have to, don't argue with me. God said it. When we look at the Torah, you guys, we take a look at this lesson. This is for us. Why won't we leave those situations when we know we should leave? It's, a, it's something that I think we really have to face. Something that really should concern us. So Lot doesn't leave. He's integrated in that city. One of the things, though, on the positive side, Lot is a lot like Noah. Okay? Lot is Abraham's nephew, and he's got some good qualities to him. Okay? He's probably the only one in the entire city that he's the good quality. So he's like Noah, because Noah was the only righteous man in his time. It looks like Lot was the only righteous man in his time. Noah was the only righteous man in his time, and God provided a massive destruction. Here's Lot, the only probably righteous man in Sodom and Gomorrah, and God is about to destroy the two cities and everybody in it. It's the same story. The exact same story. But there are some good things going on here. He's a righteous man in his time. So let me explain. What does that mean? Okay, um, I'll pick on us Christians. There's this wonderful, wonderful Bible-based Christian church. And boy, people are going there and they're teaching the Bible. And it really is a solid place. The kids are learning. But you find out that there are some Christians there who believe in abortion. Now I'm giving you the opposite because here we have a couple of people who are unrighteous in a righteous situation. That's kind of Lot. He's kind of righteous, but he's not that righteous. Okay? So you have these Christians who proclaim Jesus Christ. They're in Bible studies. They're doing everything they can, but they believe in abortion uh, totally. You'd say, wait a minute, how can you do that being in this church? The opposite could be you're in a church like um, there is a church that I know that um, welcomes the LGBT community. And they, you're welcome, we support you, everything, okay? And you could have a member of the LGBT community who is really into the Bible and getting closer to Jesus. And you may say, wow, they're not fully, you might say, compatible, okay, with what we would say is somebody who's walking with God because of the abominable, uh, abomination of their lifestyle. But the thing is, they're sort of righteous. So Lot is sort of righteous. So when you say Lot is righteous, don't think about he's a godly man. He's sort of. He's got characteristics. So for instance, look at this. He provided hospitality, right? These, I mean, just like, just like his uncle. And on top of that, in verse 3, he serves matzah. That's the Hebrew word. The first time it appears in the Torah. Genesis 19.3, Lot prepares matzah, unleavened bread. Now this is really cool. I wanted, you to, I wanted you to see this. So what's the commentary by the Orthodox Jewish rabbis on this specific verse where they, uh, we read that Lot prepares matzah? So here is the commentary on Genesis 19.3. The angels came on Nisan 15. <laughs> now some of you are laughing, okay, and those of you that are on the, on the audio, one thing that you have to understand, this is a lunar calendar, um, and uh, the lunar calendar uh, is the calendar that the Hebrews actually uh, are adhering to, and Nisan 15 is the day of unleavened bread. So we won't go into that right now. We will deal with that when we get to Leviticus and, and Exodus and so on. But again, the Torah doesn't say that. And so we can't say that. You just have matzah bread. What's better is this. 
In all of my studies in Egypt, what we have found, what we have found, what they have found, archaeologists and Bible historians, that Egypt probably, and it's very, very likely, was the one country that invented the leavening of bread. Nobody else did it. Everybody else ate matzah. So this is nothing new. However, if you're a Hebrew coming out of Egypt, and all of a sudden you see this, and you're reading this for the first time, you'd say, that's our culture. That's where we came from. The leavened bread is Egypt. Our bread is unleavened. What is God trying to say to us? The Hebrew would say coming out of Egypt. God is trying to say to us, get out of Egypt. Not just the bread. The bread is not the issue. The issue is the worldview. The issue is that which provides life to an Egyptian, and that is all their gods. Here's another good characteristic of Lot. I'm going to stick up for this guy, too, because I'm going to tear him down some more in a little bit, okay? We're going to really blast this guy in a little bit. But he protected them. He protected the men. Now, one thing that um, I found interesting, this reminded me of a movie that many of you may have seen, okay, in our day and age called The Lone Survivor. And it was with Mark Wahlberg. And Mark Wahlberg was one of a team of Navy SEALs that was supposed to go in and scout, okay, out a um, Taliban general and his second in command and their troops. And what had happened was, um, through the story, Marcus Luttrell, and that is his name, okay, not Mark, not Mark Wahlberg, but Marcus Luttrell, the real lone survivor, was the last survivor because all the other SEALs were killed in a gun battle with the Taliban, but he was saved by an Afghan, an Afghan Muslim. Now, that Afghan Muslim was a Pashtani, okay? A Pashtani is a tribe of the Afghan people. And the Pashtani people have a way of life. They have a code. And the code is, the code is called Pashtuali. And Pashtuali is the way of life for the Pashtani people in Afghanistan. So part of that, you might say Pash, Pashtuali, is the Melmastia, which is hospitality. And we said, whoa. And this is where Lot comes in because... They will provide hospitality and protection regardless of race, creed, color, sexual orientation, politics, economic status. They will give their life for you even though you are not a Muslim. Wow. And that's part of the ancient Near East culture. A little far away from where we're dealing with right now with Lot. But again, we can see that. So... The, Pashtan, the Pashtani man in the movie is like Lot. He was going to give them that protection. But, okay, we've got some good things of Lot, but we do have a problem, and that is verse 8, where Lot says, I pray you, brethren, do not uh, so wickedly. Behold, now I have two daughters who have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring, you up, bring them out unto you, and do to them as is good in your eyes. This is disgusting and vile and horrible. There is no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Now, when you take a look at the JPS Torah commentary by um, Rabbi Sarna, you find that indeed in the ancient Near East, girls were considered chattel. Chattel basically means my pickup is my pickup out there is chattel, okay? It's my possession. Um, this little black bag that I carry my microphone in and my recorder in there is my chattel. It's my possession, okay? It's just a bag. That's just a pickup. So girls were considered chattel, just something as a possession. Now, what's interesting, I want to let you know this. That in the, now, this is the ancient Near East and pagan cultures. And we take a look at the ancient Near East pagan cultures, and we see this put-down of women. And I have to say, in my opinion, that even in Christianity and in Judaism of today, we put down women. Because the verse says, all you women, you're 
our little helper, our little tiny, no, it's not. Remember, we dealt with this back in the first session. Es er conegdo, a strength in your face, okay? A strength equal to you. And we see this coming out through Genesis that God creates man and woman equal. They're both made in the image of God. What's fascinating is Plato and Aristotle, in their own writings, basically said, if you have a daughter and you don't feel like she's worth it, kill her. It was legal in Greece to kill your children if you didn't want them. Whether they had a problem, some sort of deformity, or if you just didn't want, but especially girls. Plato and Aristotle. Fascinating. So it's not only deformed babies, but any girl. And for us, what else is known? What do we talk about? 60 million babies aborted here in the United States since Roe versus Wade through 19, uh, 2014, through 2014. We dealt with that last week. So he does something really disgusting, but he's doing it as part of the culture. Now do you begin to see some added features of what's wrong with Sodom and Gomorrah? We can see some of that. Girls are worthless. Then on top of that, verse 16. Verse 16 really gives us an indication. We haven't read that far yet. But in verse 16, I think the angels are talking to him saying in verse 15, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters who are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And then it says, while he lingered, he delayed. He didn't want to go. What's wrong with this guy? I mean, they're telling the city is going to be destroyed. And then in verse 14, you can look it back up. His son and his son-in-laws, they looked upon Lot in a mocking way. They, they thought he was a joke. They weren't going to leave. In other words, Lot, in terms of his righteousness, was really not that strong because he had no credibility with his son-in-laws. Why would they believe him? No honor, no respect. Lot was definitely a fence-sitter. He definitely was. Because we can see good things and things that are wrong with him as well. What's wrong, wrong with Lot? Lot? So Torah is silent about Lot and about what's wrong with him. There's no direct statements about that. But we look at Lot and what he did, the way he lived, and on one hand, we'd say, guy's got some good qualities. He saved the angels, the two that he thought perhaps were men, from the mob. He obeyed Abraham. Abraham, so you, if you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If I go to the right, you go to the left. He obeyed his uncle. On the other hand, Lot definitely integrated into the society of Sodom and Gomorrah. He became a leader in the community. He was sitting at the gate. And on top of that, the disgusting aspect of how he treated his daughters, he was willing to give them up to the mob. So, as we go into Lesson 40, we're going to be focusing in on a set of verses. I'm not going to read them now. We'll read them once we get there. But it's 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 7 through 9. And Peter is saying, Lot is righteous. Righteous? We've seen his faults. But perhaps he is righteous. But in that we have seen how Lot seemingly has compromised. We have seen how he's been affected by the evil culture and environment of Sodom and Gomorrah. Can you imagine how the Hebrews listen to this coming out of Egypt? The first hearers of Torah? This is like them. They didn't want to leave Egypt under Joseph and after Joseph. They, they stayed. They too compromised with the even pig, even evil pagan culture of Egypt. Yeah, what about us? 
There's been an interesting study that just came out recently by Barna. They did a nationwide study of all those who claim to be Christians. And when they actually got into the study, those who say they're Christians, only 6% have a biblical worldview. 6%! That means if I'm teaching a class and there's 100 people in my class, six of the people have a biblical worldview. <laughs> What's wrong with us? Indeed, us too. No wonder Jesus used the words in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13, 13 through 14. He says, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who entered through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. The Greek word there, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, is oligos. The Strong's number is G3641. It means puny, little, tiny, in number that is. The Hebrew word that it's translated to oligos and then oligos into the English word few in the New American Standard, that Hebrew word is meat, in meaning few, puny. So are you a Christian waiting for the rapture? Really? <laughs> There's going to be so few taken, nobody's going to miss them. 6% of profess professing Christians have a biblical worldview. What's wrong with us? What's wrong with the church? What's happened? I remember a teaching of a rabbi when one of his Talmud came to him, a disciple, and he asked his rabbi, how many times should we repent? And the rabbi said, only once. Only once? The rabbi said, yeah. Repent the day before you die. And the student the Talmud, the disciple, looked at his rabbi and he says, but how do we know the day we die? The rabbi didn't say anything because the guy got the point. Repent every day. Repent. Do you want to be part of that group that's written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Then repent the day before you die. Shalom.